Every surfer knows that their board functions best when they're standing directly over the sweet spot. Now, in a modern shortboard like mine, the sweet spot is right here over the back fins and the place called the stomp pad. If your back foot is up a few inches, the board will function, but it will be sluggish and unresponsive in its terms and the way that it turns. However, if you have your foot right here over the back fins on the sweet spot, the board comes alive. It takes off and starts moving down the face of the wave the way that it was designed to be. Well, for surfers are not the only people on Earth who understand the importance of a sweet spot. Golfers get that term. So do those who swing baseball bats and those who also swing tennis rackets. In most sports, the sweet spot is the key term. If you connect with those prime inches of real estate, everything takes off in life. You know, in the pages of the New Testament, the Spirit of God tells us in 1 Corinthians 12, Romans 12, and 1 Peter 4, that the sweet spot for the Christian is called a spiritual gift. Once you find it, once you function within the framework, then your love of life begins to flow. And you whisper to yourself what I whisper to myself every single Sunday morning. This is what I was made for. This is what God designed me to do. This is what life is all about. I love to be paid for preaching, but I will give you a secret if you promise not to tell anyone. I would preach even if I wasn't paid, and I might even pay to preach because I love to do it that much. That's the sweet spot that God has given me in my life. And it's God's desire and design that every single one of you find out why he put you on this planet. That's one of the reasons I'm excited about the significant women. The significant women uh, Bible study or type of study is going to begin in just a few weeks on Thursdays, January the 23rd, going through May the 8th. And Juanita Wyatt's going to be teaching that series, not only a series of mentoring, but a series of helping all the women to find their sweet spot to discover why God has put you on this planet. And you'll want to be sure to hook up with Juanita because it will be a great time for you to discover that. Every Christian needs to know why they are here on planet Earth. Now, we noted this nugget of truth about a sweet spot many weeks ago in our very first message on the life of Elisha. We contrasted him with his predecessor, the prophet Elijah. Both prophets, both men of God, both trusting the same Lord, both serving the same nation, and names that sounded a lot alike, easy to confuse, but they're different. It's like the lady who walked into a store with two twins in tow. And the clerk looked at the twins and said, you know, those kids look so much alike. Do you have difficulty telling them apart? She said, not really. This one is Karen. This one is David. <laughs> <laughs> this one is Elijah. This one is Elisha. They are radically different in their personalities, in their passions, and their abilities. Just like you are different from your spouse and your children and most definitely from your pastor, but God's designed you to be different and to function within your divine sweet spot. That's the theme of today's sections of scripture. We're going to find two radically different ministers functioning in their framework of the sweet spot. The first one, of course, is Elisha. And today we come to our very last message on the story of the prophet. He's going to be performing his last acts of ministry on earth. And we're going to watch in just a matter of moments in chapter 8 as he cries over the corruption and devastation that will come to his people Israel 
as a result of a brand new evil monarch that will take the throne in Syria. So we see right off the bat that Elisha has a tender heart. He weeps. But in the very next chapter, 2 Kings 9, we meet a second minister who seems to be born without tear ducts. He never weeps. All he does is wield the weapons of war and shish kebabs the enemies of God. And he's just as much a holy, sanctified minister as Elisha is. Different people, different strokes, different activities. It's the way God designs it. Now, Elisha, being the prophet, is the character who orchestrates all the events of the upcoming chapters. He orchestrates what we might call, and what you will see, the bloody events of chapters 8, 9, and 10. When the Lord met with the prophet Elijah on Mount Horeb years before, he gave him a threefold commission in 1 Kings 19, verses 15 to 16. Number one, I want you to anoint Haziel as the king over Syria. Number two, anoint Jehu as king over Israel. Anoint three, anoint Elisha as the prophet in your place. Now, before Elijah was translated to heaven, he only performed one of those functions, and that is putting Elisha in his spot. Elisha now, years later, is going to fulfill the order that God gave his predecessor, Elijah. That's what we're going to see at the end of his ministry. And so as you turn to your outline today, you see the first point, and that is Elisha weeps over the wickedness of Hazael. Look at 2 Kings chapter 8 now, verses 7 through 12. Then Elisha came to Damascus. Now Benadad, king of Aram, or Syria, was sick. It was told him, saying, the man of God has come here. The king said to Hazael, take a gift in your hand, go meet the man of God, inquire of the Lord by him, saying, will I recover from this illness? So Hazael went to meet him and took a gift in his hand. Even every kind of good thing of Damascus, 40 camel loads came and stood before him and said, Your son Benadad, king of Aram, has sent me to you, saying, Will I recover from this sickness? Then Elisha said to him, Go, say to him, You will surely recover, but the Lord has shown me that you will certainly die. He fixed his gaze steadily on him until he was ashamed, and the man of God wept. Hazael said, why does my Lord weep? He answered, because I know the evil you will do to the sons of Israel. Their strongholds you will set on fire. Their young men you will kill with the sword. Their little ones you will dash into pieces. And their women with children you will rip up. Now, this is a unique ministry of Elisha because he's no longer in Israel. He's moved to a foreign territory, a foreign country. He's in Syria. Prophets generally don't make this kind of move. But it's high time for him to carry out the command that God gave to his predecessor, Elijah, years before. Now, we mentioned that a moment ago. Read it with me aloud from 1 Kings. The Lord said to him, Go return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus, and when you have arrived, you shall anoint Haziel king over Aram. King over Aram. Now, Elisha is the one who carries this out, not Elijah. When he arrives in Damascus, there's a bit of uncertainty or question mark in his mind as to how he will be received by the enemy army, the Syrians. On one hand, he did heal the Syrian Naaman of his leprosy. Remember that in chapter 5? And then in chapter 622, he sent the Syrian army back to Assyria unharmed. That was good. But on the flip side of the coin, he did trick those Syrian soldiers 
with a visual delusion in chapter 619. And we saw last week he was responsible for the panic that set the Syrian soldiers running free and allowed the lepers and the people to scoop up the spoils. So half of what he has done for Syria is good, half of what he's done for Syria is bad. And he's thinking as he walks into enemy territory, what kind of reception will I receive? Well, King Benedad of Syria is not even thinking about that kind of reception. He's not thinking about Elisha's past. He's thinking about his own present and future because he's as sick as a dog and he wants to know, am I going to die? Am I going to get well? Verse 8, take a gift in your hand, go meet the man of God, inquire of the Lord by him, will I recover from this sickness? Now, he tells his servant to accomplish this task. Name of his servant? Hazael. It's a Hebrew name that means God or Elohim sees. According to history, he's not a member of the royal family. He is a servant. Assyrian records refer to him as the son of a nobody. But he will become a notorious somebody in today's text as we've just read. Verse 9. Haziel went to meet him and he took a gift in his hand even every kind of good thing of Damascus, and how much did he bring? Forty camel loads. Wow. These good things were rich robes, precious metals, luscious wine, soft white wool, coverings for couches, all kinds of beautiful exports brought from Tyre, Egypt, Nineveh, and Babylon. You say, 40 camel loads for one man. That's awful lot. Well, Eastern ostentation induced donors to make a hypocritical show of their gifts, which tells us these were not 40 camels laden down with gifts. Every camel probably had one, maybe two gifts. What do we call that? False advertising. Have you ever been a victim of false advertising? I was at the ripe young age of eight. Now, we were living on the island of Oahu, and uh, during the summer, I went to the beach or the pool every day. I loved the water, still do. That may come as a surprise to some of you. <laughs> One day, I was eating some cereal and noticed on the back of the box an advertisement for an aqualung made especially for young boys. And it's a picture of this little kid who's diving at the bottom of the pool with compressed air. And it was only $13. I said, Mom, Dad, I want the Aqualung for my birthday. And so they bought it. And I was so excited when I unwrapped it. And that's when I discovered it was a yellow plastic float in the shape of an air tank. You strap it on your back, lay face down in the water like a dead duck, and blow through a stupid pipe. It's a piece of junk. After five minutes, I threw it aside, went swimming. False advertising. This is false advertising. 40 camelodes, you could have probably stuck it all on two. <laughs> but they're trying to impress him because they want some good news. Well, in verse 9, your son Benadad, king of Aram, has sent me, saying, will I recover from the sickness? He said, yes, you will recover, but the Lord's shown me you'll die. Good news, the sickness is not terminal. Bad news, your life is about to be terminated. Well, what do you do with that? It's like after the operation, the doctor comes in and says to the patient, Bad news, I removed the wrong lung. Ooh. Good news, this lung is getting along pretty well. That's not good news. That's not what you want to hear. Good news, you're not going to die from the sickness. Bad news, you will die from an executioner. Ooh. Verses 11, 12, 
he fixed his gaze steadily on him and he, until the man was ashamed, and then he wept, and then he said, why do you weep? And as we've read, I know the evil, I know the stronghold you'll set on the fire, the young men you will kill, the little ones you will dash, and the women you will rip up. Now get the picture here. Elisha walks up to this man, this Haziel, this servant, this son of a nobody, and he looks into his eyes, and all of a sudden, in living technicolor, the vivid, vivacious, and vile acts of Haziel are incredibly portrayed before the eyes, the holy eyes of a prophet of God. And he just stands there weeping as he sees the terrible and atrocious future. You know, when I read that passage, I thought of a movie that I saw years ago starring Christopher Walken. He was involved in a major car accident in a Volkswagen Bug, and he should have been killed. But when he survived, he was never the same again. He developed this clairvoyant ability to look at certain people and foresee tragedy in their future. At one point, he walked up to a nurse in the hospital and said, you need to go home now because your daughter's engulfed in a fire. And she ran home, and indeed, she got her out just in time. He helped the police locate a couple of serial killers. And then in the midway of the film, he goes to a political rally, and he shakes hands with a politician who is hoping to become the president of the United States. The politician is played by Martin Sheen. And the moment he ha his hand touches the hand of Martin Sheen, his eyes widen. And just like Elisha, he sees the future portrayed before him. He sees Martin Sheen as the president of the United States against all advice from his advisors as a maniacal despot going in to push the button to begin a nuclear holocaust and wipe out the world. And so Christopher Walken plans and activates the assassination of Martin Sheen. And in the end, he himself is killed. Now that is a sad story that's a tragedy. This is a sad story that's a reality. It's like God gives him a clairvoyant ability, and he sees all the history, and he begins to weep. His heart is broken. Now, you can read sporadically of Haziel's acts in scripture. His name is mentioned, and I found it in 2 Kings chapters 10, 12, 13, and in the prophecy of Amos chapter 1. But I want you to note Haziel's innocent response to this statement, verse 13. Haziel said, what is your servant? I'm just a dog. Why should I do this great thing? He reminds me of Peter. Remember the Lord's prophetic statement to Peter? Tonight, you will desert me. And Peter says, me? I will die before I deny. Like Hazael and like the apostle Peter, most of us this morning are a mystery to ourselves. We don't understand what we're capable of doing if we don't rely on the grace of God. Leon Jaworski was the uh, chief prosecutor for the Nazi war crimes and the chief prosecutor for Watergate. He describes in detail the brutal murder of eight US servicemen in the Second World War in Germany. They were taken captive after being shot down, and the men that were on their way to a POW camp in Russelsheim, which is a small town in the state of Hesse in Germany. The railway line ahead of them was being repaired so the train came to a stop. And when the train stopped, citizens in this little town surrounded the train and noticed 
POWs were aboard. Hostile murmurs began. Murmurs led to shouts. Shouts rose to a crescendo as the crazed crowd drugged the eight U.S. servicemen out of the train and began to kick and batter them mercilessly. A few people went to a Protestant pastor and a Catholic priest begging them to intervene. They did nothing. Within a brief span of time, three unrecognizable corpses lay strewn across the tracks, and the rest of the men were dead all the way down the line. Even in death, Jaworski said, they didn't leave them alone. They kept beating the bodies until intestines and inner organs were exposed to view. Here's what amazed Jaworski. He knew the people of that town. They were kind, gracious people, people like you and me. Having made every allowance for the abnormal times, Jaworski concludes, I thought of Joseph Hartkin, his two sisters, and the good-hearted people of Russelsheim. And then I realized that none of us know what we're capable of doing until we reach such a point in life. We cannot envision the heights we could reach by putting ourselves in the hands of God. And we cannot envision the depths to which we could descend without him. Amen. That's why, child of God, you must be very careful not to judge others. Because any one of us at any point point in time could commit a crime that we would never imagine in our wildest dreams. The only thing that keeps you from doing something like this is the grace of God. It's not your goodness. Amen. It's his grace, his kindness, and your smartness to respond to it. Amen? Amen. Haziel goes, what me? I'm not going to do this. Peter said, oh, Lord, I wouldn't. He did it. He did it. Verse 14. So he departed from Elisha and returned to his master and said, uh, hey, what did Elisha say to you? He said, oh, he said you're going to recover. That's half the story, isn't it? Here's the second half, verse 15. On the next day, he took the cover and dipped it in water and spread it on his face so that he died. And Haziel became king in his place. Dip a cloth in cool water as a servant, pretending to give refreshment to the king, and then ended his life. Interesting that uh, Benadad died just like the emperor Tiberius smothered on his pillow. You've heard the name of Tiberius. It comes up in, I think, the Gospel of Luke. I've been reading about him recently. What an evil pervert. You can't even believe the things he did to 11 and 12-year-old children sexually. And if those children did not perform for Tiberius, he threw them off a 1,000-foot cliff where his palace was on an island of the Mediterranean right down to the rocks to die below. Emperor Tiberius deserved to be smothered to death. I'm not sure about Benedict, but I know that an evil man killed him. An evil man who said, what, me? I'm just a puppy. The puppy became a Rottweiler overnight. And he begins his reign with blood on his hands. And so that's our first point today. Elisha weeps over the wickedness of Hazael. But now we meet the second man who has a different sweet spot in life. And you may not like him. Maybe something sick in my nature that makes me like him. <laughs> but I do like him. 
And that's point two. Elisha orchestrates the ordination of the hatchet man. And here he comes walking down the street, chapter 9. Chapter 9 of 2 Kings, chapter 9. Verses 1 to 6. Now Elisha the prophet called one of the sons of the prophets and said to him, Gird up your loins, take this flask of oil in your hands, go to Ramoth Gilead. When you arrive there, search out Jehu, son of Jehoshaphat, son of Nimshi, and go in and bid him arise from among his brothers, bring him to an inner court. Take the flask of oil, pour it on his head. So he's being anointed, you say. Thus says the Lord, I have anointed you king over Israel. And then you open the door and you run. <laughs> and you're going to see soon why he has to run. So the young man and the servant of the prophet went to Ramoth Gilead. And when he came, behold, the captains of the army were sitting and they said, I have a word for you, O captain. Jehu said, well, which one of us? He said, for you, O captain. And so he arose and went to the house and poured the oil in his head and said to him, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, God said, I have anointed you king over the people of the Lord, even over Israel. Ten years prior to this day, he told Elisha's predecessor, Elijah, 1 Kings 19, 17, Jehu will rule and ream out the wicked dynasty of Ahab. So all the things that you're going to read, all the things you're going to hear from me today don't happen by accident. Everything you will see in the next few moments is not because we have a madman on the loose. This is a holy man asked by God to do something holy, which is create a whole series of executions for evil people. We tend to forget living in a mamby-pamby culture that God is love that he is a holy God, a just God, and his love flows out of his holiness, not the other way around. Remember that. Don't become bothered or irritated over what you're going to see in the next few moments because it gets a bit gruesome. And it's all designed by God. Chapter 9 and verse 7. Here's his ministry. Are you ready? You shall strike the house of Ahab, your master. This is God speaking. That I may avenge the blood of my servants, the prophets, the blood of all the servants of the Lord at the hand of Jezebel. Jehu is the original Robocop. He is the Arnold Schwarzenegger. He is the terminator of the Old Testament. And when he begins to rule, Heads begin to roll, verses 8 to 10. The whole house of Ahab will perish, verse 8. God says, I'll cut off from Ahab every male person, bond and free from Israel. I will make the house of Ahab like the house of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, and the house of Basha, the son of Ahijah. And you could read of those chainsaw massacres in 1 Kings chapters 15 and 16. It's going to be nasty. And the dogs will eat Jezebel in the territory of Jezreel, and no one shall bury her. And he opened the door, and he took off running. He's out of there. Now, when the servants take a look at this man running, they think, what is going on here? But Jehu is Jehovah's hatchet man. His sweet spot is just a little bit different than that of Elisha's, isn't it? He has a ministry of murder. Now, don't take out of context what I'm saying today. Don't think, I'm going to get myself an Uzi and an M1. And God, no, he has not given you that ministry. He gave Jehu this ministry at a unique time for a unique reason. But it's God's sweet spot for him. It's a ministry of massacre. And it's interesting that this wicked woman is going to die in the territory of Jezreel. Now, isn't that interesting? You see, Jezreel is where Jezebel housed her 400 disgusting pagan prophets. 
Jezreel is where Jezebel practiced her disgusting idolatries to pagan gods. Jezreel is where she tried to kill the prophet Elijah in 1 Kings 19.2. And Jezreel is where she orchestrated the execution of innocent Naboth in 1 Kings 21.7. And Jezreel will become her onion field. This is it for you, sister. You're going down fast. Because I have orchestrated a hatchet man just for you. Verse 11. Now Jehu came out to the servants of his master. And one said to him, is all well? Why did this, watch this, mad fellow come to you? And Jehu said, well, you know very well the matter is talk. In other words, oh, he's cuckoo for cuckoo. Pots. He's nuts. They assume he's bonkers, but he's a servant of God. Do you know that he's not the first servant of God to be called by others insane? When Paul preached before Festus in Acts 26, what did he say to him? Paul, you're nuts. You're mad. Your great learning has driven you crazy. But there's also someone before Paul, who was also called insane by his own family. You know who that was? Jesus. This is why we don't pray to Mary. This is why we don't worship Mary. This is why we don't say Mary was sinless, because Mary joined in, according to Mark chapter 3 and verse 21, with the family and said... When they heard Jesus preach, he's lost his mind. He's lost his senses. What is he thinking? And they were taking him into custody as if he were a nutcase. This is Mary. This is James who wrote the epistle of James. This is Jude who wrote the book of Jude. Say, so why would they do that? They were afraid. They were afraid of the Pharisees, who were the respectable people who did not like what Jesus was saying and the message he was preaching. So they decided to side with the wrong side. It's like the man going to a Halloween party dressed in the costume of Satan. And all of a sudden, it began to pour rain outside. So looking for shelter, he darted into a Baptist church. And they're right in the middle of a revival meeting. And at the sight of the man with the devil costume, people began to scream. They were running out the doors. They were jumping through windows. They didn't care. Just get out of there. All except for one lady who got her coat sleeve snagged on the pew. And as he got closer and closer, she said, Satan, I've been a member of this church for 20 years, but I've really been on your side all the time. <laughs> And the family of Jesus say to the Pharisees, now we've been a member of his family for 20 years, but Mr. Pharisee, we've been on your side all the time. We think he's nuts. It's the lost world this morning who've lost their martyrs. The Christians are the sane ones on Halloween. Verses 12 to 13. They said, it's a lie. Tell us now. He said, oh, okay, here's what he said to me. Thus says the Lord, I've anointed you king over Israel. And they hurried. Each man took his garment, placed it under him on the bare steps, and blew the trumpet, saying, Jehu is king. So the moment the announcement came, it's like the Spirit of God swept over all these people, and they instantly accepted without question in mind, this is the new king of Israel. And he has a ministry of mopping up to do. Now in verses 14 through 28, Jehu chases down Joram, king of Israel, Ahab's son, and in verse 24, shoots him right through with an arrow. He's the first one to go. Ahaziah, king of Judah. He's not even in Ahab's lineage. He's a different king, is killed too. 
Why does he kill Ahaziah? Because you're friends with Ahab's lineage. Everyone connected with him, even winks at him, is going to die. Jehu loves his job. <laughs> Jehu has found his sweet spot. He's having a fun time, and he's being driven by the holiness of God. Chapter 10, verses 1 to 7. Jehu sends letters to the guardians of Ahab's 70 sons. Now, I'm sure that's with more than one bride, thank you. <laughs> 70 sons, and he says this message in verses 1 to 7 of chapter 10. I want you to place the heads of those 70 sons in a picnic basket, and I'll be by later to pick them up. And in one day, 70 boys lose their lives. This is the holiness of God and his hatred for idolatry and rebellion. Don't screw around with those things in your life. Don't put another person like your spouse or your child or a friend or an activity in the place of God and worship it and adore it and push God aside. He doesn't think that's funny. He doesn't think it's cute. And contrary to our bad theology in the 21st century, he's not gracious toward it. We're told that Jesus Christ, Hebrews 13, 7, is the same yesterday, today, forever. God loves me. God hates my sin. Say that with me. God loves me. God hates my sin. And the more you love God, the more you will hate sin when he brings it up in your life. You will not tolerate it or justify it. That's why this is given in the word of God. I'm convinced that's why he chose Jehu's found his sweet spot. Chapter 10, 11 to 14, he asks a group of people, where are you going? They said, going to visit Queen Jezebel. Wrong answer, vivisect them, and they're done. You say, this is unbelievable. I can't believe it. Yeah. Some things are too hard for us to stomach, but they're true. William Williman ends a story on God's judgment in these words with his people. Some of you have heard me tell about my early ministry when I served a church in rural Georgia. One Saturday, we went to the funeral of a relative of some in my church. It was a little country church, not of my denomination. I'd never been to a funeral like this one. They had the body out there, and the casket was open. And the preacher was preaching. The preacher pounded the pulpit, looked at the casket, said, it's too late for Joe. He may have wanted to get his life together. He may have wanted to give his life to Christ. It's too late. That can't happen now. It's too late for Joe. It's not too late for you. You must decide, and you must decide today. Then the preacher went on to tell of how a Greyhound bus plowed into a funeral procession on its way to the cemetery, killing half the people in the cars. Today is the day to get your life together. It's too late for Joe. It's not too late for you. William said, boy, I was so angry at that preacher. On the way home, I told my wife, have you ever heard anything so manipulative, so insensitive to that family? I found it disgusting. She said, William, you're right. It was manipulative. It was insensitive. Worst of all, it's true. I'm not asking you to like everything you read in the Old Testament. But I'm telling you, it's true and it's accurate. 
And if you have a problem with anything in the Bible, the problem is you. It's not God. Ask God to open your eyes and say, why would you put something this far to your mother? And he will tell you, because my child, I want you to see how much I love you and hate your sin. And although God was gracious for many, many years with the family of Ahab, things got worse and worse, and then finally, it's Operation Extermination. Now, we've talked about the executions of this man and what he has done, but the climax of the hatchet man's career occurs in the previous chapter with the death of the most disgusting lady to ever walk the pages of scripture. Her name is Jezebel. Say that with me just like that. Jezebel. Okay, good. Now, we're going to read this passage, and when I come to the word, and you look at it in your Bible, I want you to say it just like that, okay? All right, go back to chapter 9. Back to chapter 9. Get ready as they come to verse 30. Now, I'm going to read aloud, but I'm going to stop when I come to that name because you're supposed to read that name, and you know how you're supposed to read it. Here we go. Chapter 9, verse 30. Ready? When Jehu came to? That's great. Again? Heard of it, and she painted her eyes and adorned her head and looked out the window. Now, she's plastering on the makeup, folks, but she's getting a little bit old now, so she needs some crack filler to take care of some of those gaps in the face, you know. One little boy asked, uh, hey, Dad, how come women live longer than men? He said, well, son, it's because paint is a great preservative. <laughs> well, she puts on a coat of paint, but it doesn't preserve her life. Woo, verse 31. Then Jehu entered the gate, and she said, is it well, Zimri, your master's murderer? Say, who's Zimri? 1 Kings 16, 9 to 20. Zimri assassinates the king of Elah of Israel, usurps his throne, and then seven days later, he ends his own life. And so she says to Jehu, you're no different than Zimri. You're a loser just like him. And of course, that's completely wrong because Zimri was incited by ambition and selfish cruelty. We've already discovered that Jehu was incited by divine retribution, he has a holy mandate in life. She looks at him and says, you're just like him. What's she doing? Making a comparison. Ever make a comparison? You do it every day. Can I give you a little piece of advice? Most of your comparisons are wrong. Most of them. So-and-so did that. He did that. You're just like him. We make assumptions constantly. We're so far off base. Hey, you got divorced just like they got divorced. And they were wrong. You must be wrong. Not necessarily. Wisdom says you examine each situation on the basis of its merits. And then you make a decision. Don't make this comparison, Jehu. Or Jezebel. Jehu is nothing like Zimri. But you know something about Jehu? And this is what's exciting when you're in your ministry. You don't care about the little tacks and little bantering that's going on. You got a job to do. You can yap all you want. I'm hearing this. I want to hear this. And pretty soon everyone's going to hear this because you're going down, sister. He's on a ministry of murder. Death mission from God. Watch 32 to 34. And then he lifted up his face to the window. And Jehu shouts, who's on my side? Who? Two or three officials looked down at him. He said, throw her down. So they threw her down. And some of her blood was sprinkled on the wall and on the horses. And he trampled them under her foot. When he came in, I like this, he got hungry. He ate and drank. And then he said, oh, see now this cursed woman and barrier." Or she's a king's daughter. He wipes his hands clean. He says, ah, this is a good day's work. He stops in a Charlie's Chili. <laughs> and after a bowl full of beans and a few belches, he thinks, you know, she was cursed, but she was the daughter of a queen. 
So I tell you what, the nice thing would be to go out and bury her. Get ready for verse 35. They went out to bury her, but they found nothing more of her than the skull and the feet and the palms of her feet. That's bad. J. Vernon McGee put it best. It's gruesome, it's ghastly, it's gory, and it's downright grisly. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, if you're one of those unique characters that likes horror stories, you don't have to watch Carrie, Cujo. I know what you did last summer, Freddy Krueger. Read the Bible! This is the best horror story in all of Earth. It's wonderful, and I love it. I love the scripture. It tells everything. It has judgment. It has grace. It has tenderness. It has righteousness. It has compassion. It has horror. It has it all. It's so good. <laughs> and then it gets a little bit better. And that's verse 37. Corpse of Jezebel will be as, whoo, dung on the face of the field of the prophecy of Jezebel. And they can't even say this is her because it says in verse 36, this is the word of the Lord by he spoke of the prophet Elijah the Tishbite, saying in the property of Jezreel, the dogs will eat her flesh. Perina dog chow. <laughs> She's gone. She's done. Wow. Jehu is done with his job. Elisha, done with his job. Think about these guys, won't you? Elisha, Jehu. They mix perfectly, right? Like oil and water. Elisha never even saw Jehu. He says to a servant, you go give him the message and then you run. I don't want to talk to that guy. He's nuts. You just go do it. But God said, he's my man and I've anointed him. You got a half-crazed hatchet man orchestrating the holiness of God. And on the flip side, you have a prophet of profound kindness and grace. Both employing their sweet spot. Which brings us today to the lasting lesson which God wants you and me to learn. Let's say it together. God designs different strokes for different folks. That's a great lesson, isn't it? In our first message, we discover the personality differences between the prophet Elijah and Elisha. We went into great deal in our first point. You know those guys were even different in their deaths, which they had nothing to do with? 2 Kings chapter 2, we saw months ago that Elijah didn't die, did he? He was swept into heaven in a chariot of fire. Now, Elisha does die, but... He performs one of his greatest miracles, watch this, after his death. Got to turn to it, 2 Kings chapter 13. 2 Kings 13, let's take a look at it. 2 Kings 13, verses 20 and 21. Elisha died, and they buried him. Now the bands of the Moabites would invade the land in the spring of the year. They were burying a man, and they saw a marauding band. Now they cast the man into the grave of Elisha, and when the man touched the bones of Elisha, he revived and stood to his feet. <laughs> now that is a miracle beyond miracles. You got a dead person, throw him on dead Elisha, he'll come alive. Wow! Elijah never did that, but Elisha did that. After he died, don't put God in a box. Don't ever tell God you can't do this. Well, you can because then he will do it. One of the worst things you can ever say is, God, I hope I, you never send me here to minister to this person because he will orchestrate that because he has a great sense of dry humor. He likes to do the things that you think that he can't do, just like this. Both these guys were different as night and day, just like Jehu and Elisha. The only thing they had in common is they served the same God. You go, that's my wife and me. Only thing we have in common is we got married in the same day. <laughs> I mean, I was drawn to her because she was so different from me. And what attracted you then is distracting you today. Quit letting it distract you. God made your mate to be different from you. 
thank God for the areas in which he or she is alike. That's cake, that's gravy, that's easy. The areas in which they're dissimilar to you are the areas in which God's spirit is shaping and honing off the rough parts of your character to make you more like him. That's true with that child. You say, where'd they come from? He doesn't have my nature, yours, this guy's a nut. God goes, I put him here because I want to make life fun for you and your wife, you see. And so it is with the person maybe you're sitting next to in the pew today. Don't get wrapped up in trying to change anyone. Anyone. Not your child mother. Not your wife husband. Not your pastor parishioner. Just kidding, you don't really know. <laughs> you just let people do what God's called them to do. And you start focusing on number one. And you start asking yourself this question. Why did God put me on this planet? The greatest tragedy for you as a Christian would be for you to die without having answered that question and accomplished God's will for your life. You could take all of the rest of those New Year resolutions and you could flush them down the toilet until you've accomplished this one. Why am I God will tell you why you're here. God will show you why you're here. You're here for a purpose and a reason. You're here to find your divine sweet spot. And you'll know when you found it. Because when you have found the divine sweet spot, you will be like that girl that dancing girl in the 90s film, I'm so excited and I just can't hide it. You will be dancing around because you're realizing, this is why he made me. Why he made me. Consider the unique sweet spot of a young boy named Bill Frank. He was the elder son of a dairy farmer. Dad would raise this boy Every single morning at 2.30, he'd help with the chores, and he hated it. His brother, Melvin, loved it. He grew up to be a farmer. It was wonderful for him, but Bill Frank could not stand farming. <laughs> same father, not the same sweet spot. You know, the minute he finished his chores, he would run into the hayloft, and he would read the copies of Tarzan and Marco Polo. Anything that talked with adventure was his to read. As he got a little bit older, by the time he was 14, he had traced the decline and fall of the Roman Empire. And if there's anything about missionary stories or adventurers or people out on the edge doing something crazy, traveling around the world, this boy loved it. Later, when he went to Bible college, he started hooking up with ministers and evangelists. And he, he spent time with them. He, he, he caddied for them on the golf course. He, he shined their shoes. He posed to have pictures taken with them. And this boy had also one other trademark. It was called energy. <laughs> he was hyperactive before the term existed. His mother said, thank God he's turned five. He's getting ready for school next year. I can't wait. Parents took him to the doctor. They said something's wrong with their son. He's all over the place. He never wears down. And the doctor said, God made him that way. <laughs> now you consider the mosaic of this young boy's life. Fascinated with books and words. <laughs> Intrigued by missionaries in faraway lands. Passion to travel the world. But what happens to a boy like that? What happens when the Spirit of God gets a hold of his life and says to him, young man, you're a sinner and you need to come to the cross and meet Christ and get saved because I have a plan for you. I'll tell you what happens to a young man like that. He drops his middle name. And I'll tell you why. It's because uh, evangelists need to be taken seriously. And Billy Frank Graham has been taken very seriously. Let's bow our heads together.